talking about the epidemic basics of uh, epidemiology following uh, the diagnosis of uh, urinary tract infections and how to uh, manage a patient with acute pyelonephritis or febrile uti then uh, we'll have a look on like uh, risk factor for recurrent uti and uh, management of these risk factor before i like begin there is a disclaimer that a lot of content of this talk is uh, been taken from the uh, latest revised clinical practice guideline by Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology, which are yet to be uh, published probably next uh, four to six months, we'll have those guidelines. So coming to the definition, so uh, urinary tract infection is uh, defined by, uh, based on, you know, uh, the symptom, which might be like non-specific in the younger kids especially, but you have to have a uh, urine culture positivity uh, and significant growth of a single organism to label somebody as having urinary tract infection. So as you know that uh, UTI are one of the most common bacterial infection, more so in younger uh, kids. Almost 30 to 40% of these uh, children who develop febrile UTI may have underlying uh, abnormality of urinary uh, tract. So that's why it's important to evaluate uh, them carefully. And another important uh, significant about your febrile UTI that almost uh, 10 to 30 percent of these kids might have recurrence over the next six to 12 months. And there is obviously definite association of uh, uh, febrile UTI that it might lead to long term, you know, uh, kidney damage. So coming to the epidemiology, as I mentioned, that is one of the most common uh, bacterial infection in uh, childhood. Its prevalence does vary as per you know, the uh, age of the kids and gender as well as race and circumcision status. So if you look at this figure, initially during three to six months, uh, it's more common in uh, boys as compared to girls, but as age increases, it's predominantly girls tend to have more uh, uh, UTI compared to boys. And if you look at the overall data, you know, uh, febrile infant presenting to emergency room, almost 7% of those kids uh, have like probability of having uh, underlying cause of febrile uh, or fever, it's uh, urinary tract infection. So coming to the classification, so we can classify urinary tract infection based on their site and uh, symptom as well as uh, factors associated with them. So infection, which is chiefly involved, you know, your uh, kidney parenchyma are uh, classically termed as uh, pyelonephritis when your uh, urinary tract infection localized to bladder and urethra is uh, uh, labeled as uh, cystitis. You can have, you know, the asymptomatic bacteria, which is in classical uh, sense, it's not uh, urinary tract infection, but you have significant growth of bacteria without symptoms. So it's, uh, uh, term as asymptomatic bacteria, then you have symptomatic UTI, which can be like, you know, febrile, and, but you might have non-febrile symptomatic UTI. Based on the associated factor, whether you have like uh, septicemia or, uh, you know, uh, high-grade fever or toxicity or underlying uh, congenital anomaly of urinary tract, they can be labeled as a complicated UTI. And if you don't have on any of these symptoms, they are like uncomplicated UTIs. As I mentioned in the uh, first slide as well, your symptoms uh, can vary from your age. So if you have infants, there might be non specific symptoms like fever, lethargy, vomiting, or you know, refusal to feed. feed. And in, in, in fact, in uh, neonates, you can have uh, urinary tract associated uh, leading to like jaundice or something like that. In older kids, you tend to have more specific symptoms like, you know, loin pain, tenderness, incontinence, and uh, frequency, and, you know, burning micturation. So there you might get, you know, more specific symptom of urinary tract infection. <clears throat> Coming to the diagnosis of urinary tract infection, the corner stone is chiefly, you know, to take a crucial, uh, a, like, you know, focus ST and examination. Then urine analysis obviously uh, forms as you know, uh, one of the important crucial component of uh, making the uh, diagnosis. But one thing is pretty sure that you have to have like confirmed uh, mention of the uh, suspicion based on HD and urine analysis. Uh, you have to have 
confirm based on urine culture. If you don't have urine culture positivity, uh, like difficult to label somebody as having urinary tract infection. <clears throat> so one of the important crucial component in making a diagnosis of urinary tract infection, more so in the children who are like non-toilet trained to collect, you know, the uh, urine uh, in a proper sterile way, so it doesn't get contaminated and uh, like not end up, you know, wrongly labeling somebody as having urinary tract infection. So in literature, chiefly there are four different ways of, you know, collecting the urine, whether you use, you know, the uh, the classical gold standard of chibra-pubic aspiration, which is an invasive method, and it's probably, you know, the most sensitive method in terms that you there is hardly any risk of contamination with chibra-pubic aspiration. Then you have bladder catheterization, which also, you know, a bit uh, invasive in terms of that it might have, you know, uh, some pain while catheterizing and there is, you know, a small risk of uh, contamination with bladder uh, sample taken by bladder catheterization as well. Then you have clean catch where you have to, like, uh, uh, collect the urine during midstream. Then there are ways of sterile, you know, uh, sorry, the... Uh, plastic bags and other stuff is there. <clears throat> when we talk about, you know, the toilet trained children, the current recommended uh, method of collection is, you know, the uh, clean voided midstream urine sample. So overall, in uh, non-toilet trained children, classically that you have to, you know, use pubic aspiration and it's, uh, if you do it under ultrasound guidance, it's pretty safe procedure or you maybe like use bladder catheterization because it's obviously very difficult and uh, time consuming to collect a clean cat uh, sample in that. And one thing I would uh, uh, the, want to give you a specific message that there's a big no of using nappy pads and adhesive bag for collecting sample in any like whatever age of the kid because there is very high risk of, you know, contamination if you're using nappy pads and adhesive bag sample for culture. So uh, urine analysis, you have to like uh, perform in a uh, standard way. So it should not be capped. It should be like ideally processed within two hours of collecting the samples. And you have to examine at 10x and as well as an high power field. And ideally you should require at least 20 fields uh, to be examined. So coming to the what all things we need to see in urine analysis, obviously you have to look at the, you know, the uh, WBC count as well as uh, bacteria and urine to uh, make a diagnosis of urinary tract infection. So significant uh, leukocyteuria area, if you have a centrifuge sample, then more than five WBC per high power field. And in an uncentrifuge sample, more than 10 uh, per millimeter cube uh, in a fresh centrifuge sample. In terms of significant bacteria, if you even find a, you know, the uh, one single bacteria, then it's uh, considered as significant bacteria. So then we have, you know, the uh, other alternate uh, ways of uh, looking for, you know, evidence of urinary tract infection. These are like deficient based on your nitrite and leukocyte estrage. So basically most of the urinary tract infections are uh, caused by chiefly by E. coli, almost contributing to 85 to 90% of the uh, uropathogens. So the bacteria converts nitrate to uh, nitrate to nitrice, which affect them based on dipstick. Leukocyte restrage is basically indirect evidence of a presence of WBCs in urine. So overall, uh, there is, seems to be like, you know, data will suggest that nitrite and leukocyte restrage can be uh, use as an initial screening uh, tool. So uh, coming to the urine culture, so as I mentioned previously that you uh, need to collect a uh, urine sample in a sterile way that it should not get contaminated. Then you have a specific, uh, you know, number of bacterial count based on you define whether this uh, urine culture, whatever growth is there can be considered as evidence of uh, urinary tract infection or is uh, like, uh, is whether it's contamination. So one of the 
thing is that ideally there should be you know that uh, single organism growth if you are growing multiple organism in a single urine sample is like more likely to be a uh, contaminated sample than uh, urinary tract infection and know that that is based on your uh, uh, method of collection there are specific cutoffs which consider as evidence of urinary tract infection so if you have collected sample uh, on clean uh, catch medistream sample then 10 to the power 5 colony forming unit if you have collected through the catheter then it's 10 to the power 4 and if you have collected through the suprapubic aspiration then any number of pathogens are considered uh, significant this any number is deeply you know they uh, correspond to 10 to the power 3 so in recent literature, there is, you know, uh, some bit of debate about whether you be, need to exactly, you know, take a specific cut of 10 to the power of 5. But in, uh, if you have, you know, clear cut symptoms of urinary tract infection, uh, most of the time, uh, if you even have like 10 to the power 4, you will be considering it as a urinary tract infection and you will be treating with antibiotics. So. Uh, a last Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology guideline for urinary tract infection came almost uh, like you know decade back in 2011. So we are in process of revising these guidelines. So currently we are uh, considering that urine culture uh, is you know must for diagnosis. Somebody as having urinary tract infection, you can use microscopy for uh, screening and presumptive diagnosis and starting the antibiotic. But confirmation has to be based on urine culture. So I want you to focus uh, for a you know minute on this table. So that what uh, in, you know a specific case scenario whether you can label somebody as having urinary tract infection or not. So if you have all three you know symptoms are there, there is a leukocyturia and you have culture positivity. There is no doubt that is urinary tract infection. You know in some of the patient you might have not non-specific symptom. You know like uh, some bit of dysuria vomiting, in, especially in young infants. If you have leukocyturia, significant leukocyturia with uh, urine culture positivity, you still will end up this as labeling urinary tract infection. You have to treat it. Even, you know, in some proportion of patient, you might not uh, find significant leukocyturia, but there are classical symptoms of UTI and you have culture positivity. Then you also have to label it as UTI. Another scenario might be there whether you you don't have either of you know your symptoms and uh, significant leukocyturia only urine culture is positive. So these are patients typically of asymptomatic uh, bacteria. So if you have symptom and there are you know WBC in the urine, which can be scenario with many you know uh, febrile uh, infection, in fact many viral infection, in, but your culture is negative. You can't label this patient or this uh, particular kid as having UTI. So your culture has to be positive to somebody as labeling as urinary tract infection. Coming to the asymptomatic bacteria, earlier it was considered that asymptomatic bacteria, you know, it's uh, uh, there in considerable professor patient, but current literature suggests that it's uh, almost one to two percent of kids are affected with asymptomatic bacteria is usually the E. coli, which is of low virulence organism, which is not, you know, able to uh, elicit enough inflammatory response to lead to symptoms and uh, this thing. So that is chiefly, you know, benign condition and does not require therapy. So if you treat this, uh, you know, asymptomatic bacteria might end up uh, getting the you know, my antimicrobial resistant and UTI with uh, uh, multi drug resistant organism. So currently our guideline would going to be recommend that we don't need to treat asymptomatic bacteria and we don't need, you know, the uh, confirmation of uh, treatment of a acute UTI with, uh, you know, the following culture or repeat culture. Coming to the therapy of acute pyelonephritis and urinary tract infection, so chiefly in therapy, you have to, uh, three questions that what antibiotic to choose, which route to choose, whether you need to give it uh, enteral or 
parenteral and what duration of antibiotic need to be given. So next four slide, I am going to show you the you know some of the evidence that uh, which antibiotic, what route, and how much duration we should give. So this Cochrane systematic review you know, looked at the oral versus intravenous antibiotic therapy, and they found that you know the, uh, so what they have compared that uh, in one group they have given oral uh, antibiotics, and another group initially they have given oral uh, intravenous antibiotic followed by oral therapy maybe like switching on day uh, four or five. And they found that there is no you know, difference in time to uh, uh, resolution of fever. Similarly, there is uh, not a significant difference in terms of uh, kidney scarring at six to 12 months following UTI. And another systematic review looked at uh, whether, you know, a uh, short course of intravenous antibiotic, which is like you will give intravenous antibiotic for three, four days followed by oral switching, or the long course of intravenous antibiotic, which might, you know, uh, varying from seven to uh, 14 days. So there is no symptom, uh, there is no uh, significant difference in terms of, you know, persistent of bacteria after treatment. Uh, same is whole true for persistent of kidney damage at the end of six months. So these uh, systematic group clearly suggest that, uh, you know, oral antibiotics are as effective as uh, parenteral antibiotics. So uh, we are going to recommend that using oral antibiotic for acute pyelonephritis uh, is, uh, you know, as effective as parenteral antibiotics, except is probably there are uh, two, three scenarios where you might have to use intravenous uh, antibiotic for treatment of uh, acute pyelonephritis. One is patient is like, you know, 56 is not able to take uh, oral antibiotic. Another one is probably during, you know, the uh, neonatal period. And as far as concerned about the duration of antibiotic therapy for cystitis, which is chiefly, you know, based uh, the diagnosis in adolescent because it's in younger kids, it's obviously very difficult to differentiate acute pyelonephritis and cystitis. So adolescent uh, kid coming with, you know, the uh, evidence of uh, cystitis, you can treat it with uh, oral antibiotic for three to five days. For uh, you know acute pyelonephritis, uh, overall uh, therapy duration going to be uh, be uh, shortened. Probably last guidelines said is uh, ten to fourteen days, but we are going to shorten to probably seven to ten days of intra uh, antibiotic, whether it's intravenous or intravenous followed by oral or totally oral. So in current uh, scenario, based on the evidence. When you encounter a patient with febrile UTI, you will uh, diagnose it based on your urine analysis and the cystic and urine culture. The cystitis, you will treat it for like five days with acute pyelonephritis. And patient have, you know, probably like a uh, very young infant of less than three months, evidence of uh, high grade fever and marked toxicity, and is unable to take uh, oral therapy. Then you will give intravenous antibiotic maybe for. Uh, three to four days, depending on uh, response to symptom. Once you have this thing, then or total courses need to be given for almost seven to 10 days. So one of the major problem with, you know, the uh, uh, acute pyelonephritis that it might lead to uh, kidney damage. So recently people have uh, looked at that, they found that, you know, this inflammation associated with acute pyelonephritis is more damaging than this directly, you know, the bacterial infection, which is leading to uh, kidney damage. So what people have uh, tried that they are tried to uh, suppress this inflammation with the uh, adjuvant low dose steroid therapy for short course. This is probably, you know, analogy to if you look at in uh, meningitis, where uh, bacterial meningitis, where you use low dose uh, dexamethasone to prevent tearing and other associated uh, fibrosis associated complications. So analogy to that, people have tried to use a uh, short dose of uh, corticosteroid therapy for prevention of uh, uh, kidney scarring in acute pyelonephritis patients. As of now, this 
uh, oral data is of low certainty data and there are only limited number of studies but there seems to be some promising uh, result but based on whatever current literature we have is not you know we can't recommend it routinely but only we need further more larger trial to look at this uh, short course issue therapy for prevention of infection so coming to the you know the imaging part uh, so if you are uh, seeing a patient with a uh, febrile uti with first episode you need to do ultrasound you know a good ultrasound is uh, required because as i uh, if you remember i mentioned in first and second cell probably that there is a considerable proportion of these patient with febrile U uh, uti do have underlying uh, congenital anomaly of urinary tract almost 30 to 40 percent so you have to do good ultrasound if there is any abnormality whether it's you know the uh, presence of hydronephrosis or urethrocele or you know the thickened bladder or maybe like uh, discrepancy in kidney size so any clue regarding uh, your underlying congenital abnormality you go need to do uh, micturating sister urethrography to rule out underlying whether it's pub or is uh, vesicurotic reflux or other uh, abnormality of urinary tract infection simultaneously you need to assess for you know the uh, bladder bowel dysfunction so what is bladder bowel dysfunction i'm going to discuss in next uh, next slide if you have you know the uh, patient coming to you with you know previous history of uti or recurrent uti so recurrent uti for all clinical practice uh, is chiefly in that any uh, two episode of uh, febrile uti during uh, your childhood so it does not have to be like within six months or within one year you have to have two episode of febrile uti so for all uh, clinical practice purpose any two febrile episode of uti during childhood are considered as uh, recurrent uti so if if you have a child with recurrent uti and um, a urinary tract infection causing by non e coli uh, uti within a uh, two year of life then even if there is no abnormality on ultrasound you directly uh, go for micturating sister urethrography because these uh, kids would have you know higher risk of uh, having the underlying uh, kidney or urinary tract abnormality another uh, point which i want to highlight here is you know the uh, dmsa so dmsa is chiefly done to look for the kidney scarring and it's ideally need to be done four to six months after a febrile episode of uti because if you do it immediately or during acute febrile uh, episode you might get non specific uptake defect which are chiefly you know the evidence of acute inflammation so you might confuse them with as a kidney permanent kidney damage or kidney scarring so dmsa has to be done after four to six months of your uh, uti episode to detect you know the persistent or chronic kidney scarring which is actually can associate with long term consequences so coming to the recurrent uh, uti as so i mentioned almost uh, 30% of children might experience recurrence of uti during uh, 6 to 12 months of your last uh, febrile uti episode the current chief risk factor which can contribute to recurrence of uti is that you have like you know the uh, a structural anom anomaly of urinary tract which might be chiefly the primary vesicurotic reflux or there is bladder bowel uh, dysfunction younger kids tend to have more frequent uti so does you know the uh, boys who are like uncircumcised so coming to the bladder bowel dysfunction so it's uh, basically a group of you know a spectrum of uh, symptoms with uh, related to your lower urinary tract and may or may not accompanied by bowel disturbances like constipation and cough rashes so uh, literature clearly suggests that bladder bowel dysfunction are much more common in kids who have a recurrent uti or primary vesicourethral reflux so if you look at this figure in normal you know school going kids the overall prevalence of bladder bowel dysfunction is uh, somewhere around 15 to 20 percent 
but kids who have recurrent uti without underlying psycho uh, ureteric reflux their prevalence is almost 40% and patient who experience recurrent uti in setting of primary vesicular ureteric reflux almost half of them have bladder bowel dysfunction so it's currently considered as a, like one of the you know uh, important risk factors for recurrence of uti so way back in 2019 we uh, looked at one of these meta analysis which clearly suggests that patient who have you know uh, presence of bladder bowel dysfunction almost they are at uh, two times higher risk of developing urinary tract infection compared to those who don't have bladder bowel dysfunction hence is uh, very important to uh, screen all of the kids who coming with the recurrent episode of uh, uti and you have to treat it treatment is chiefly you know the behavioral modification of prop proper toilet training you need to ask them for you know frequent voiding up to uh, three uh, three hourly interval they need to take you know plenty of fluid to uh, and they should avoid you know post voiding of uh, voiding and if there is a constipation you need to treat it aggressively if you do don't treat constipation you would have persistent of the uh, bladder symptoms so constipation in the setting of recurrent uti has to be treated aggressively coming to the one of the other important risk factor is vesicular ureteric reflux is basically you know retrograde flow of urine from bladder to uh, urinary tract and is uh, a aberration in, uh, during development process which lead to you know uh, the loss of this wall wall mechanism which is physiologically uh, there in this uh, intramural part of ureter kind of act as you know wall physiological wall for retrograde flow of urine but if you have aberrant or abnormal embryological development process you might uh, loss this physiological wall and with age this you know this uh, as your intramural part of ureter grow, grows this uh, physiological wall mechanism may uh, you know develop and that's why there is you know spontaneous resolution of ur uh, can be seen ur can be graded based on your uh, finding in the maturity sister urethrogram from grade 1 to grade 5 and this is Uh, based on international reflux studies in 90s 80s the highest grade which is grade 5 is you know the uh, you have like thought process ureter uh, loss of pelvic ileal system uh, impression and full dilatation of your uh, uh, tract from you know the lower part of ureter to pelvic ileal system grade 1 when well, you have reflux in up to like uh, mid part of ureter grade 2 your uh, reflux up to like a uh, pelvic ileal system grade 4 you would have tortuosity of ureter and grade 3 is uh, somewhere between grade 2 and uh, grade 4 so for this grading purpose you need mcu study if you just need to like diagnose uh, uh, vr you can uh, go with a drcg drcg basically on the radio nucleotide uh, scan which will give you the whether there is reflux of urine and the ureter so this is, these are the drcg films where you can see that uh, so basically this dye is injected per urethra and you can see the presence of dye in uh, upper part of ureter or maybe up to kidney so based on this you can diagnose that there is a reflux of urine in the uh, ureter tract but unfortunately based on drc you can't like you know grade which is uh, uh requires for you know uh, deciding the further management one of the important crucial uh, things which associate with uh, vesicular ureteric reflux is uh, kidney scarring so kidney scarring can be of two types one is like congenital kidney scarring another is uh, scarring which is uh, double of following your uh, urinary tract infection or pyelonephritis so in last 10 year or maybe 15 year there is uh, you know recent development or better understanding about the uh, these kidney scarring so dysplastic or congenital kidney scarring is basically abnormal developmental defect not is doesn't have is 
has nothing to do with your urinary tract infection or in fact like uh, vesicular urinary reflux so as i mentioned in the last slide this uh, dysplastic is scarring is pro problem of you know uh, during development and vesicular urinary reflux is probably part of same thing so it's not uh, because of you know the pressure which is uh, being there because of back uh, back flow of urine is a abnormal developmental defect so there in, on dmsa you have like you know symmetrical contraction of the kidney compared to the acquired post uti scarring where you have focal defect in one, one part of you know cortex so it's important to differentiate uh, this dysplastic uh, scar from the acquired scar because their long term consequences this the progression to esrd and ckd is different so most of the time ckd in setting of uh, primary vesicular urinary reflux develop in those kids who have this dysplastic congenital scarring and acquired scarring rarely lead to progression to ckd or other consequences like hypertension and proteinuria so what is the overall proportion of uh, patients who develop kidney scarring following uti is around 10 to 15% the important risk factor for developing kidney scarring are high grade reflux or dilating reflux which are chiefly grade 3 4 and 5 if you have delay in antibiotic initiation following uh, you know development of fever so if you start antibiotic more than 3 days after development of uh, like occurrence of fever then there is increased risk of developing kidney scarring so it's also been reported if you have organism uh uropathogen other than e coli so these are the important risk factor for kidney scarring coming to the management of hypouretic reflux so currently there are you know uh three ways of managing them whether you do surgical reimplantation or you use endoscopic deflux to you know the block that uh, retrograde flow of urine or you use conservative Uh, management that is antibiotic prophylaxis so there is huge debate that which one of them to be uh, uh, intervention to be uh, used for management of vesicular urinary reflux so next maybe uh, you know six seven slide i will try to clear the that which management to be used for which patient so when you compare of these three uh, interventions so antibiotic prophylaxis you know is conservative you don't need to go for uh, uh, surgery and is obviously relatively cheap but problem with antibiotic prophylaxis there is increased risk of antimicrobial resistance and it's not effective in preventing the kidney scar formation deflux does prevent your uti but problem of endoscopic deflux that is you know as of now in india is pretty expensive and a common person probably can't afford it and another issue that there is high risk of failure rate so you might have to do you know three four or five sessions of these things almost uh, it depend on you know the training of a surgeon that failure rate may be there like 30 to 40% of failure rate obviously surgery you are you know kind of uh, treating that underlying abnormality but is obviously is like uh, invasive procedure uh, child has to go to anesthesia and other stuff and another problem with surgery that it doesn't change your long term outcome it's almost as similar to as antibiotic prophylaxis so uh, even if you reimplant uh, or uh, surgically correct the reflux it's not going to change your long term uh, outcome in terms of the progression to ckd hypertension or proteinuria unfortunately we don't have much literature comparing the antibiotic prophylaxis versus surgery whatever literature we have is from uh, 90s and 80s so this systematic review looked at the uh, studies which have compared antibiotic prophylaxis versus antibiotic prophylaxis with surgery so unfortunately we don't have any rcts comparing directly comparing surgery versus antibiotic prophylaxis so in this is Uh, systematic review they have clearly shown that progressive kidney damage whether you use surgery plus antibiotic prophylaxis or you just use antibiotic prophylaxis 
when we look at the uh, current literature on uh, endoscopic deflux versus antibiotic prophylaxis it's almost similar data so it's a uh, similar number of patients uh, can be prevented uh, from febrile uti but it doesn't make much difference in terms of uh, kidney scarring so neither of uh, currently available intervention are effective to prevent uh, worsening of kidney scarring or development of new kidney scar coming to the antibiotic prophylaxis is traditionally be the you know most conservative uh, approach which most of uh, pediatric nephrologists would follow one of the point which i want to highlight that this whatever antibiotic you choose it has to be like narrow spectrum antibiotics and currently mostly data is available about whether it's cortamoxazol or nitrofurantoin both of these antibiotics are relatively like contraindicated in younger kids more so in infant less than 6 months so there you can use cefalexin so i would urge you people that do not use broad spectrum antibiotic like omxiclab or you know the cefixim for antibiotic prophylaxis antibiotic prophylaxis has to be like with narrow spectrum antibiotic most for last two decades you know there has been multiple randomized control trial which had looked at the uh, efficacy of antibiotic prophylaxis compared to placebo one of the largest trial from north america is this revo trial which uh, so that there at the end of you know two years uh, you have almost like 50% uh, reduction in uh, risk of recurrence of uti if you use antibiotic prophylaxis compared to placebo the major problem with this study that they chiefly included 92% uh, their population is comprised of girls at same point of time there was a study from india which exactly showed you know the opposite result that with uh, antibiotic prophylaxis there is increased risk of you know symptomatic uti the most likely explanation for that that uh, study from india had chiefly comprised of uh, boys and it was like you know the high grade reflux so during this double uh, uh, revision of uh, our ispn guideline process we looked at you know all these randomized control trial and we have done uh, meta analysis to look at the current evidence of antibiotic prophylaxis for prevention of recurrent uh, uti the patient is you know do not have any other congenital anomaly or psychiatric reflux and they have recurrent uti so almost there are uh, five randomized control trial looked at uh, these kind of uh this uh specific population and in final pooled estimate we find that there is you know no evidence that antibiotic prophylaxis prevent a recurrence of uti so we are going to clearly recommend that do not use antibiotic prophylaxis for prevention of uti in children with normal urinary tract is not going to work but when we uh, look at uh, you know the uh, patients who have dilating vur which is grade c4 and 5 almost there is a uh, three times higher risk of developing or having recurrence of uti compared to non dilating vur so we kind of uh, did perform in you know, the uh, subgroup analysis or we have kind of dissected out the data that uh, what's the efficacy of antibiotic prophylaxis in low grade non dilating vur compared to dilating vur so for grade one and two we were if you look at there you know this uh, relative risk of uh, preventing uti or reduction in uh, febrile uti is almost crossing your 95 uh, ci so it may or may not be effective in preventing the uti but when we looked at you know the high grade we were there seems to be like you know moderate certainty evidence that it does reduce your uh, uh, risk of uh, developing febrile uti by almost uh, 36% the yeah, another important crucial uh, part as i mentioned is uh, prevention of kidney scarring but currently available evidence does not suggest that using antibiotic prophylaxis uh, prevent kidney scarring the major problem with uh, 
antibiotic prophylaxis that you know the this might increase risk of developing QTI with multi-drug resistant organism. So this risk is as high, you know, they are uh, like six uh, times higher odds of developing uh, UTI with multi-drug resistance uropathogens. So based on whatever our data I showed you in last C4 slide, uh, current uh, recommendation would say that uh, would use antibiotic prophylaxis only children with high grade VUR. And this antibiotic has to be the spectrum oxygen and nitroferentoin. And for uh, children younger than six months, you can use cephalexin. There are a specific scenario where you might uh, be exception to this circumstance, right? like if you have, uh, you know, bladder bowel dysfunction or uh, younger uh, infants where one might consider using antibiotic prophylaxis. But as of now, the data with uh, is there only to for high grade VUR. Another question with antibiotic prophylaxis is how long one needs to uh, keep giving it. So last uh, our guideline recommended up to like five years of age. So we kind of going to modify that. You can consider stopping antibiotic prophylaxis when you once you do not have you know uh, febrile UTI in last one year. Uh, given the fact that uh, child has to be like toilet trained and there is no evidence of bladder bowel dysfunction. So you can stop antibiotic prophylaxis as early as, uh, you know, in a kid of two year old, but these conditions need to be fulfilled that child is toilet trained. There is no evidence of bladder bowel dysfunction and no uh, history or recurrence of febrile UTI in last one year. So if antibiotic prophylaxis are not effective, then what else we can you know, look for? That there are non-antibiotic intervention. One of them is you know, the uh, cranberry product. So cranberry products does contain uh, something called proanthocyanidin, which inhibits the addition of your E. coli to uroepithelial. So that's how it prevents you know, the uh, development of in last uh, year, we looked at you know the uh, at least uh, five randomized control trials, which does test that if you use a cranberry product, this might reduce the recurrence of uh, febrile UTI by almost fifty percent. Problem is that is overall you know the low certainty evidence, only like a small uh, RCTs. Another major problem with uh, cranberry product that. For, to prevent UTI, you need to ingest a large amount of uh, cranberry juice, almost like 60 to uh, 72 milligram of cranberry. Uh, this anthocyanidin containing uh, juice has to be ingested to prevent uh, uh, UTI. So that is one of the major problem. As far as probiotic concern is, uh, as of now we have only like very two small RCT, so further trial or further larger studies are probably needed. Circumcision does play in you know, a crucial Dr. role in... Hello? Uh, Dr. Jitendra, just a, a, a small announcement of that was about 40 minutes into your lecture. So I do hope you will yeah. be able to summarize yeah. because there are a lot mm -hmm. of questions from the audience. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'll try to uh, cover up in like next slide. <clears throat> so, Circumcision, you know, has, there has been a lot of literature on circumcision and uh, recurrence of UTI. So whatever current evidence we have, we have summarized in this uh, uh, systematic review, which we have performed as part of this uh, process of development of this uh, new guideline. So it's whatever data we have is clearly suggests that circumcision is effective in preventing urinary tract infection, and especially in boys who have high grade viewer. So number needed to treat for like normally if you take overall population is you know pretty high but if you take only patients or kids with high grade VR the number needed to treat is four so that means you have to uh, uh, circumcise four boys to prevent one episode of febrile UTI so there is seems to be like uh, good 
good in the evidence but again you know there are uh, social issues in certain uh, seasons so obviously you can't recommend it doing in every kid so yeah so uh, but it should you know uh, offer to uh, parents especially who are having or facing the recurrent episode of febrile uti that they can consider uh, exercise their kids for preventing further use febrile uti so one of the important things which i want to highlight to you people that uh, you know the vesico urethral reflux does resolve spontaneously with time so this resolution time might be different as per your underlying severity so if you look at this uh, table in grade 1 and 2 uh, your median time to resolution is around 3 years for grade 3 it's almost like 98 months uh, for grade 4 and 5 it uh, take you know longer time but another important thing that you know, with time, this grade might downgrade. If somebody is having grade five, it might downgrade to grade three and grade two. And as I showed you in one of the previous uh, slides, that if you have low grade VR, risk of recurrence of febrile UTI is much low compared to somebody is having grade four and five. So the so now the uh, current expert would say that. You know, giving the, all the fact that it, uh, VR does resolve with time, and uh, you know, there is hardly any data to you know uh, superiority of surgical intervention of reflux or reimplantation compared to antibiotic prophylaxis. Most of people would say that you need to manage vesicular reflux conservatively. That too, if you are having recurrent episode of febrile UTI and high grade VR. So. If you look at you know the uh, worldwide trend that what all you know, so there are a lot of uh, guidelines for urinary tract infection almost every major country would have uh, their own guidelines. So nice guideline is from you know UK they would clearly say that uh, you only need to consider in a patient who having recurrent UTI. American Academy of Pediatrics would say that there is uh, no role of antibiotic prophylaxis they are not effective. Italian guideline would say that you can consider it in only high grade VUR. The Australian and Korean would say that this antibiotic prophylaxis is, is, you know, probably useless. Uh, it's not effective in preventing anything. So, was our uh, approach going to be like if you have primary vesicuretic reflux following diagnosed following urinary tract infection, if it's low grade VUR? and there are no bladder bowel dysfunction, you probably don't need to give antibiotic prophylaxis. If you have bladder bowel dysfunction, then give it a resolution of that bladder bowel dysfunction. And high grade VUR, even in absent of bladder bowel dysfunction, you consider it up to two year of age. If there is a bladder bowel dysfunction, then give it up to, you know, antibiotic prophylaxis up to resolution of UR, which maybe like one year, two year, whatever duration of it. But despite, you know, appropriate management of bladder bowel dysfunction and antibiotic profile, UTI, you might consider surgical reimplantation or endoscopic uh, or deflux therapy. Another, uh, as I mentioned that uh, vesicular reflux does associate with your acquired scarring and chiefly the congenital kidney scarring, which create problem. So these kids need to be uh, followed up for their you know development of proteinuria and hypertension, as well as resolution of uh, vesicular reflux. So re resolution can be you know uh, uh, detected based on DRCG. You don't need to do repeated uh, MCU. And they don't need to, you don't need to do it, you know, every one year or two years. It depends, as I showed you, that grade four and five does take, you know, longer period, maybe like five or six years. So maybe like three to four year interval is good enough uh, to detect resolution or downgrading of UR. So I will leave with this uh, some of the few key messages that diagnosis of UTI has to be based on uh, urine culture. 
without urine culture, you should not label somebody as having urinary tract infection because as I have covered it in last 30 minutes or so, recurrent episode of UTI does have different connotation compared to, you know, single episode of febrile UTI. Another important key message that oral antibiotics are as effective as parenteral for management of acute pyelonephritis. So you don't need to give injection or inject injectable antibiotic for every episode of UTI. And probably duration is going to come down from 14 days to probably seven to 10 days. Kidney damage can be prevented if you start antibiotics early. And uh, as far as management of recurrent episodes of QTI, only patients who are you know high uh, risk of recurrence with a deeply dilating VUR and bladder bowel dysfunction would get some benefit of uh, ma management with uh, continuous uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, low dose antibiotic prophylaxis. Patient, most of the patients with VUR would not require surgical intervention. They, you know, a very small proportion who develop, uh, keep continue to have febrile UTI despite proper management of blood bubble dysfunction and, and uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. The last key message is that, you know, the whatever CKD in these patients would happen is because of congenital dysplasia and because of developmental defect rather than, you know, the acquired UTI, with, uh, uh, acquired uh, scarring, which is like after the UTI. So, yeah. Hello. Okay, Dr. Jitender, thank you. Thank you for the uh, uh, evidence based lecture on uh, the current management of UTI and also a sneak peek into the guidelines. So, we have uh, quite a number of questions uh, from the audience. So, the first question was uh, What are the positivity rates of uh, urine samples in UTI? I presume that uh, the, uh, the participant is asking for culture positivity rates. Uh, or a leukocyte or dipstick positive rates. Positivity rate of? Uh, urinary tract infections. Uh, that is culture positivity. If uh, there are 100, 100 urinary tract infections, uh, if, uh, if uh, untreated UTIs come to you, I presume that is what the, uh, oh. the participant wants to know. 100 patients okay. with urinary tract infections come to you. Then, uh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. How, how much, how many would you get a urine culture positive, and how many? Would uh, be the is the culture culture positivity. We do take a cutoff. So, it's, uh, as I told you, the, the clean voided sample is ten to the power five. Currently, recommended cutoff is ten to the power five. So, with that cutoff, you know, the uh, you would have eighty five to you know almost. Uh, 95% patient having uh, the culture positivity, but still you will miss the actual UTI probably in five to seven percent of the patient. That is, you know, the it's very difficult to you know uh, differentiate uh, contamination from actual UTI. So whatever current cutoff tends to the five or five would give you a you know, true positivity rate of almost like, uh, if you have to give you one single figure, it's probably, you know, 90 to 95%. What about the dipstick? How often will that be possible? Leucocyte nitrate or both? Leucocyte nitrate. So I think uh, these, the current evidence is, I think we are still uh, in the process of having this, uh, uh, systematic review result. I think this, any one of this, uh, my ace or anybody from AIMS uh, are there, Georgie. I think they are still performing uh, that systematic review. So, okay. whatever last data I have is uh, this one that leukocyte stage alone is around you know, 83% sensitivity, specific of 78. If you use either of them, is 93% sensitivity and a specificity of 72%. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, till what sample should uh, uh, we, should we do urine sample by catheterization, and when should when can we start uh, clean catch samples for culture? Uh, a specific? Uh, you asking a specific age? Yeah, yeah. What age is the cutoff for uh, uh, midstream clean catch, and vis-a-vis vis-a-vis uh, vis compared to 
So, so there is no, no cutoff like that. You know, if you can collect it in uh, infant, it's well and good. There is like no uh, like contraindication or cutoff that uh, you can't use clean cast sample in uh, younger kids. You can if you can collect it like you know a sterile way, then you like. I mean, like you can use it for uh, urine culture, in fact, in non toilet trained uh, kids. Yeah, but commonly we use it uh, all toilet trained children. We can use uh, midstream cream catch if they are, you know, able to wipe yeah. on command. But, and, uh, able but to hold what I mean, urine. like, what I mean, like, yeah. is there is no contraindication that you can't use in non toilet trained children. If you are yes, yes. following the sterile technique and you are able to uh, uh, collect, you know, so you can use it for like culture specimen. Yeah, sometimes it does happen that, you know, when we are preparing the child for a suprapubic aspirate or for a catheterization with the coldness of the betadine or iodine that we use, sometimes the child voids and sometimes that may be, cap that may be your attempt to capture it in a clean catch fashion that, you know, it's a practical difficulty that is faced. Okay, the another question is, in a child with uh, cystitis on ultrasound and without any clinical symptoms, and uh, child also has phimosis and poor growth. Should he be treated for UTI on the basis that he has uh, poor growth, he has uh, phimosis and uh, cystitis? No clinical symptoms. So cystitis on ultrasound is, you know, like pretty much non-specific finding, which I see, you know, every day in like a lot of kids, if you get the ultrasound done for whatever purpose. So it's, one is has to be like, you know, the urine culture has to be like positive for single organism. And, uh, you know, there has to be like, you know, some symptom of suggestive just based on the, the because on ultrasound, the whatever radiologist reports are like pretty much non-specific things. Cystitis. So there has to be culture positivity and some symptom to uh, uh, like treat kids. Uh, uh, having cystitis or urinary tract infection. Right. So uh, another question, I have answered this in chat already, but uh, it is good to reiterate. Now, what is the rationale of starting antibiotics in a patient with signs and symptoms and abnormal urine routine? Should we wait for culture to start uh, antibiotics or uh, treatment should be started promptly with the symptoms and uh, abnormal, you know, dipstick or urine analysis? So as you know, that culture does take time to or give you the final report and if you have to wait so it has to be like you know uh, the balance or probability of you know the your uh, symptoms and whatever you have analysis findings you get so i would rather you know start antibiotic therapy uh, rather than waiting because i clearly showed you if you delay the therapy for more than three days there is a risk of higher risk of developing kidney scarring so it depend on your, uh, uh, you know, clinical decision making that how high on card is like in that particular case or uh, child is you are suspecting as having lower urinary tract, uh, sorry, urinary tract infection. So I would suggest that if you strongly suspecting or there is good enough symptoms and uh, urine finding of suggestive of urinary tract infection, you should not wait for culture report to start antibiotic therapy. Yes, prompt treatment is uh, mandatory for uh, urinary tract infection management. Okay, the next question is, are afebrile, period, afebrile episodes of UTI, somebody has having a, maybe dysuria, and uh, I presume that culture is positive. Uh, are they considered in the definition of recurrent UTI? Yes, they are very much uh, considered in, if you have symptomatic UTI, they are very much uh, should be considered as a part of recurrent UTI. Recurrent UTI is not just like febrile UTI. Sure. Uh, okay. And uh, is there any time frame for recurrent UTI? That is uh, two episodes in six months or two, three in a year, or is there any time frame for recurrent UTI definition? Somebody has an infection in the, in, at uh, one yeah. year and then the next infection at two and a half. Do we evaluate or not? As I mentioned during talk as well, that there is no specific, you know, time frame anywhere in literature and whatever, like I, you know, discuss with expert, there is no like specific time period, unlike uh, similar to like, you know, recurrent pneumonia, where you have to have like two, three episode of uh, recurrent LRTI to define recurrent pneumonia. 
So for all clinical practice of in childhood, any two episode of uh, symptomatic UTI need to be taken as recurrent UTI. So like there is no single time frame to label somebody with having recurrent UTI. Yes. And uh, is there any time interval? What's the uh, actual time interval between a UTI episode and MCU? After treatment, when should we do the MCU? What is the time frame? So once you are sure that patient is you know, uh, treated, there is resolution of clinical symptoms. There is no specific recommendation that how long you can wait, but for well, maybe like within uh, two weeks, you can do it safely. There is like so, you know, risk of having a recurrence of UTI. So maybe like two weeks is good enough to wait. All right. Uh, do they require antibiotic prophylaxis in the meantime? Uh, so that that's you know pretty question. So if you have like pretty tough question. So if you have like uh, on ultrasound that there is you know a dilated ureter or you know the hydro. So single question. Uh, if I have to give you single line uh, answer, is like big no because whatever we have uh, seen that it's only high grade VRA which is like uh, get benefit out of antibiotic prophylaxis. So this two weeks not going to you know uh, make make much change. Uh, so single answer is probably no. You first need uh, to detect right. the high grade VR on UTI, uh, sorry on MCU, and then decide on further management. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the another question is uh, if antibiotic prophylaxis and surgery have both have same outcome, what is the ideal line of treatment for a VR? You have already uh, answered this question in your slide, but uh, you can give a two-line answer or summary that would be great. So ideally, you know, ideal scenario, you need to sit down with parents, explain the pros and cons of all three therapies, whatever current evidence we have. And if parents are able to understand, let them take their own decision. But most of the time, our, our settings is would like parents would end up saying that, uh, you are doctor and you have to decide it for our kid. So uh, as I told you that if it's a uh, high low grade VUR, there is you know uh, nothing abnormal on ultrasound. You probably can leave it as a conservative therapy and uh, assess for BBD and so there should not be any other risk factor. So you can leave it like even without antibiotic prophylaxis. High grade VUR, I would still. Uh, think that antibiotic prophylaxis are like decent first uh, choice or first therapeutic uh, strategy. And uh, so parents have to be like pretty much compliant to therapy. We do often see that compliance to this antibiotic prophylaxis is pretty poor, maybe like uh, seven, 60 to 70%. So that has to be like ensured. You need to ensure the proper, uh, you know, uh, management of bladder bubble dysfunction. So most of kids would have like, you know, a uh, good response to this strategy. If still you are having recurrent febrile UTA, then you can consider surgical reimplantation. Thank you. And uh, one last question from the audience. Uh, suppose a patient is uh, catheterized for some reason and a few days down the line, he develops a fever. You do the urine routine and culture, you find uh, some positivity. So do we treat it as a you I mean UTI per se or a catheter associated UTI? Or what are the guidelines in a patient who's catheterized? How do we diagnose a UTI? Okay. So ideally this uh, bag sample for urine collection is like not advisable. So probably you need to remove that catheter and take fresh sample, whether it's a uh, medistream, but that might not be possible in a patient who is already, you know, catheterized most of would happen in like critically sick children. So you would remove that catheter, you insert press catheter and collect sample from that. But uh, this bag sample is definitely big, big uh, no for uh, you, uh, your uh, urine culture. So presumably, you know, based on, depend on, you know, overall, clinical scenario of patient, you would obviously think that there is catheter in situ and you are finding, uh, you know, uh, uh, evidence of UTI on initial urinalysis. I would assume it's like presumptive UTI and will start on antibiotic therapy. Sure. 
Thank you. That would be the practical way to approach uh, uh, this scenario. Uh, uh, in view of lack of time, we are moving on to the next uh, uh, talk. Uh, over to Dr. Sumantra for the next session. Thank you, Dr. Jitendra, for uh, uh, evidence-based uh, and uh, practical and interactive lecture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Can I request Dr. Jitendra to please uh, office size chair? So our next talk will be on uh, Kakut and renal cyst disease. And our next speaker will be Dr. Christy Catherine. Uh, Dr. Christy Catherine is a DM fellow pass out from Ames, New Delhi. And currently she's attached to Government Medical College, Alakusa. And her thesis topic was also regarding renal cystic disease. So all the audience is yours, Dr. Christy, please proceed. In between, please, uh, all to the audience, please enjoy the uh, talk and then try to put your questions and doubts in the chat box. Over to Dr. Christy. Thank you, Dr. Sumantro. Respected sir, respected madam, uh, dear pediatric residents and dear colleagues. So my topic is uh, has combined two diseases, the cystic kidneys and caput. Uh, these are two distinct diseases and there are uh, these there are few distinct diseases uh, in these two groups. They may mimic each other. My aim is to familiarize you with the uh, diseases. I won't go deep into the subject. I have included a few case scenarios also. Please try to answer these in the chat box. So I will start. These topics will be discussed in the top uh, in the presentation. So starting with the cystic kidneys. The first question is how will you identify cyst in the kidneys? Cyst usually we identify in the imaging or in the pathology. In the imaging or the ultrasonography, we identify the cyst as hypoechoic or anechoic lesion. You can see the anechoic lesions here. These are the cysts. Here also you can see anechoic lesion. These are the cysts. Here you can see very small anechoic lesions. These are also cysts. So here uh, along with the cysts, you can see that the corticomedullary differentiation is lost. Here also we cannot distinctly say uh, between the cortex and the medulla. What you see here is this is this look anechoic, but this is the hypoechoic medulla of a normal ultrasonography of a kid. So if you uh, change the view or uh, change the, uh, check the vascularity, then you can differentiate between the hypoechoic uh, medulla and the anechoic cyst. Uh, simple cysts exist in children too, but the frequency of the simple cysts increases as the age advances. So. What is the pathology of cystic kidneys uh, in any person? Uh, cysts are formed by the dilatation of the glomeruli or any part of the nephron or after a loss of tissue, you, after a tissue damage. The uh, pathogenic mechanism uh, is attributed by the defect in the primary cilia or pathways affecting the cell signaling or proliferation. The dilatation of the tubules and cell proliferation is specifically affected, especially in case of autosomal dominant polycystic kidneys and autosomal recessive polycystic kidneys. Tissue fibrosis and dilatation of the collecting tubules are especially affected in nephronothosis and autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease. Nephronothosis is autosomal recessive tubular interstitial kidney disease. So the, uh, usually these cystic kidneys are called celiopathy uh, because the primary cilia is the culprit. Primary cilia is a non-motile cilia. It is a microtubule-based axoneme covered by a specialized membrane. There are nine peripheral microtubule doublets arranged around a central core. They sense extracellular signals and transmit inwards. They regulate the cell proliferation, differentiation, cell polarity, nerve growth, and tissue maintenance. How did uh, the, uh, the cilia and cystic kidney link in? This is by the unified theory of cystogenesis. When uh, the uh, products of all genes that are mutated in the cystic kidneys, in the humans, mice, or zebra which were studied, they found that all were localized in the primary cilia or in the basal bodies or centrosa. That's how the unified theory of cystogenesis came. The cilia has different roles in different tissues. The clinical phenotype of the disease will depend upon the tissue-specific expression of the sensory cilia. So once you are suspecting a cystic kidney disease, we should get a clinical history and examination, radiological, radiological examination, and sometimes we may need genetics to conclude into a diagnosis, make a diagnosis. 
the uh, most important uh, diagnosis include the ARPKD, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, nephronathosis and nephronathosis spectrum disorders, autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease. The management depend upon the diagnosis and our management uh, will depend upon the status of the renal function, what is the extent of the extra renal manifestation, and uh, is there a specific treatment available for the condition, then the management uh, will add on that too. So uh, from the history, we, we antenatal detection is usually available. Uh, usually done in diseases like ARPKD, nephronathosis, very early, very early onset ADPKD, uh, HNF1 beta like ADT, uh, TKD, there you can have an antenatal presentation. The oligohydramnios may indicate severity of the renal involvement. And uh, while if a patient is having an oligohydramnios, we should watch out for the respiratory complications too. The most important history is the uh, inheritance pattern. Whether the parents are involved or the siblings, uh, parents and the siblings are involved, that may suggest an autosomal dominant inheritance that is uh, present in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease or tubular interstitial kidney disease. Some forms of Kakut or renal dysplasia are also uh, inherited as autosomal dominant and they closely mimic the cystic kidneys too. Autosomal resistance is suspected when you have a consanguineous marriage and siblings, parents are not involved and the siblings are involved. These disorders included uh, include the ARPKD or the autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, nephronothosis spectrum disorders, some metabolic disorders with renal cysts. Exlinked inheritance is seen in OFD. So next, after the inheritance pattern, we will look at the clinical features. Polyuria polydipsia is usually seen in nephronothosis, uh, spectrum disorders, dysplastic kidneys, or in tubulopathies. Cardiac failure associated with cystic kidneys are often associated with the presence of hypertension, severe hypertension, which is expected in autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease or in very early onset, where the patient is involved more when the age is less than 18 months, ADPKD is present. That is called a very old, early onset ADPKD. Hematemesis may be uh, uh, present in case of hepatorenal fibrocystic disease, especially the prototype is autosomal recessive polycystic kidneys, whether the, where the liver is affected by either by congenital hepatic fibrosis or the patient is having intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation or carolis disease. Polydactyly is seen in conditions like bardell Beadle syndrome. bardell Beadle syndrome is included in the next chronothesis spectrum disorders. Inguinal hernia is an association of ARPKD. Retinitis pigmentosa, which may present as night blindness, is present in uh, nephronothesis spectrum disorders, Joubert's Ubert syndrome, bardell Beadle syndrome. Molar tooth sign, you all know, it is associated with Ubert syndrome. Content hepatic fibrosis in hepato, as I have already uh, mentioned hyperuricemia, hypomagnesemia, and diabetes seen in autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease, especially when associated with the HNF1 beta variant. Skeletal dysplasia and ectodermal dysplasia seen in Sensebrenner syndrome. It's under the nephronospecies spectrum disorders. So while uh, we have gone through the clinical features, now comes the imaging. The imaging, first thing you should look is presence of any caput. Is there any uh, hydronephrosis? Is the patient is having multicystic dysplastic kidney? That will make us uh, the, the naked diagnosis of second resist. Then we should check the patient is having whether large size kidney, normal size kidney, or a small size kidney. Large kidneys are seen in ARPKD, ADPKD, infantile nephronothesis, and HNF1 beta. Mutation. Small kidneys are seen in nephronothesis, ADTKD, or dysplastic kidney. While uh, in the course of the disease, normal size kidneys may be seen in ADPKD, RPKD, and nephronothesis too. So the location of the cyst in the ultrasonography will depend upon the pathology. Uh, in case of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, all the two, the glomeruli and any part of the tubule can dilate. So any part of the uh, kidney can, uh, can 
have a cyst in case of autosome and dominant polycystic kidney disease. In case of ARPKD, nephronothesis, and ADTKD, mainly the dilatation is at the level of collecting duct. So if the cortical collecting ducts are involved, the, uh, the cortical cyst may be there. If the medullary collecting ducts are involved, medullary cyst may be there. So most often their cysts are corticomedullary. The radially arranged elliptical shape uh, cysts are a characteristic of a characteristic of ARPKD. So with this, we will move on to the uh, first question. We have an eight-year-old boy who complained of intermittent low in pain. So he was evaluated. His growth and development was normal. His ultrasound showed large kidneys with around one centimeter sizes. He had he has stage one hypertension. His renal functions are normal. What is the most probable diagnosis? You want to put your question answer in the chat box. You want further history? Want to ask anything specifically? You can give it family history. You have to ask the family history and extra renal manifestation. But here, his mother is affected with large kidney senses, and the diagnosis then becomes ADPKD. Very good. So, ADPKD is a systemic illness with expanding cysts in any part of the nephron. Uh, it presents with decreased renal function, hypertension, proteinuria, and urine concentrating defect. These are the renal manifestations. Extra renal manifestations include the liver cyst, pancreatic cyst, diverticulosis, cardiac valvular defect like MVP, intracranial aneurysm, cyst infection, hematuria, nephrolithiasis, and RC, uh, renal cell carcinoma are the uh, complications. So the diagnosis is based on the family history. Uh, there are definite uh, image-based criteria for uh, uh, diagnosis of ADPKD uh, in adults. These include, one of them is unified criteria of five. Uh, other include the patient may be having a normal large kidney with cysts, and any part of the kidney can have cysts. And uh, larger sister cysts are more in ADPKD. Definite diagnosis is uh, based on genetics too. Uh, the genes included include the PKD1, it's the most commonly affected, uh, and the PKD2, IFT140, GANAP, and DNAJB11 are recently described genes. If you have uh, the severity of uh, uh, the disease will depend upon the genetic variant. PKD1 variant is severe than the PKD2 variant. And if you have a PKD1 truncating variant, it is more severe. So this is the international guideline for the diagnosis and management of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney. So you have a child with suspected ADPKD. The uh, current radiological method for screening is ultrasonography. Uh, you have a child with a family history of ADPKD. If you have one or more kidney cysts, it's highly suggestive of ADPKD. If you have a fetus or no more newborn with a uh, positive family history of ADPKD, hyperechoic or enlarged kidneys are suggestive of ADPKD. If you have a sibling at risk of ADPKD and uh, the patient is not showing any cysts, then the screening should be repeated at three early interval. If you have multiple cysts with negative family history, usually 90% of ADPKD patients have family history. Only 10% of these cases are de novo mutation. So if you have a negative family history, you have work up for other cystic kidney diseases also. If you have a solitary cyst, you have to follow up. So in case of children less than young, uh, 15 years, we have now established MRI-based criteria too. Most of the image-based criteria are uh, established in more than 15-year-old. So the management will depend, uh, essentially it is supportive care, uh, like lifestyle modification, increase the fluid intake to maintain a low urine osmolality, uh, decrease the soil intake, maintain weight, uh, and uh, blood pressure should be controlled very well. And you have to control the proteinuria, uh, acidosis, and control the other chronic kidney disease complications also. So in case of uh, specific therapies advised and approved by FDA, 
uh, in more than 18 year old with CKD 1 to 4 having rapidly progressive kidney disease. The approved therapy is tolbeptin. We rapidly pro we will identify the rapid progression of the disease based on the kidney volume. If it is increasing rapidly, there is a specific cutoff. We can consider it as a rapidly progressing disease. Or if the GFR is falling rapidly, it also has some uh, one cutoff. And if the parent is having an ESRD by the age of 58 years, that also suggests a rapidly progressing disease. Risk of progressing factors include the male sex, truncating PKD1 variant, and the onset of urological complications before 35 also suggests the patient may be at risk of rapidly progressing disease. So we will move on to the next stop. Next case. Here you have a seven-year-old girl who presented with polyuria polydipsia from two years of age. She has difficulty in night vision, which is refractory to vitamin A therapy. She's underweight and short. She has no hypertension, no acidosis, no alkalosis. She has deranged renal function with a stage three CKD. She has small kidneys with altered CMD with cysts. What is the most probable diagnosis? Anyone want to answer? Very good. It is NPHP spectrum disorder or the nephronothesis spectrum disorder. So nephronothesis is an autosomal recessive tubular interstitial nephronopathy, most common cause of ESRD in the first three decades of life. Uh, the most common is the NPHP1 variant uh, causing the disease. There are multiple genes which has etiological possibilities and it causes multiple phenotypes of diseases also. Some syndromes with similar pathology that cause the nephronothesis are included under the nephronothesis spectrum disorders. The classification depend upon the age of reaching ESRD will be like infantile nephronothesis if the patient reaches ESRD below two years of age. The patient e uh, reaches uh, ESRD around 13 years of age till it's called a juvenile nephronothesis if the, on, the median age of ESRD is 19 in case of an adolescent. Uh, type of nephronothesis and uh, it can be further classified depend upon the clinical features whether there is congenital hepatic fibrosis whether there is uh, retinitis pigmentosa or uh, it can be it can be classified further depend upon the gene involved whether it is nphp1 involved whether it is nphp3 or 4 involved uh, like that also we can classify the disease the uh, renal manifestations of nephronothesis include polyuria, polydipsia with renal dysfunction, uh, early anemia. Extra renal manifestations include retina, retinal dystrophy, barded beetle phenotype, neurological manifestations in tuber, hepatic fibrosis. Unlike the other cause of chronic AD disease, hypertension is late, except in case of infantile nephronothesis. Proteinuria is late, except in case of specific mutation causing proteinuria. Extra renal manifestations include oculomotor apraxia, retinitis pigmentosa uh, in case of, of the hemological involvement, then mental retardation, cerebellar ataxia, hypopituitarism uh, in the central nervous system, elevation of hepatic enzyme fibrosis, biliary duct proliferation in the hepatic system, phalangeal cone shaped epiphysis, short ribs, polyaxial polydactyly, skeletal dysplasia in the skeletal system. Others include situs inverses, cardiac malformation, bronchitis, serility, hyperlipidemia, ectodermal dysplasia, and obesity too. These are few extra renal findings. This is the image of the liver, which is showing extra hepatic biliary radical dilatation. So this, what is the finding here? It's polydactyly. Then you have the retinitis pigmentosa. What is the finding here? It is situs inverses. Usually situs inverses is seen in, uh, in PHP 2 and 3. Here you can see the Ubert syndrome with the molar tooth sign. Current management is by uh, there is no specific management, supportive care only, care of the CKD. You have to manage the complications of DKD, growth failure, anemia, mineral bone disease, acidosis, and hypertension, yeah, and the management of the extra renal features. So coming to 
case three. We have a three month old born of third degree consanguineous marriage. The patient has antenatally at severe oligamnios in the last trimester. Currently, she has stage two hypertension, normal renal function, mild hyponatremia. Ultrasound done for abdominal distension showed large kidneys with multiple small cysts. What is the most probable diagnosis? Which other system will you screen? Okay, uh, we, we usually use ARPKD. Uh, the term ARPKD, it's not ARPCKD, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. It's not ADPKD. Here I have not mentioned about the family history and I have mentioned that there is third degree consanguinity too. And it is a typical presentation of ARPKD with a severe oligamnios. Uh, severe hypertension, the early early onset severe hypertension, and the kidneys filling the abdomen with multiple small cysts. So yes, it is ARPKD. So ARPKD is characteristic with uh, is the hepatorenal involvement. It has autosomal recessive inheritance with one in twenty thousand uh, live birth uh, incident. It uh, show fusiform collecting tract dilatation and causes massively enlarged renal cysts, massively enlarged kidneys. Uh, and uh, in the liver, there is ductal plate malformation uh, causing congenital hepatic fibrosis or intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation. The genes attributed include the PKHD1 and DSDI-PR1L gene. There is significant phenotypic heterogeneity. The uh, renal involvement uh, and the severe oligamnios cause the lung hypoplasia. The renal involvement can cause severe hypertension and renal dysfunction. The hepatic involvement can cause portal hypertension, hypersplenism, varices, and bleed and cholangitis. So the poor prognostic mag, uh, markers in case of an antenatal diagnosis include the oligamnios at the second trimester, which can uh, which may be associated with the pulmonary hypoplasia. If the patient is having a renal size more than 4 SD with oligomnias, it is almost having a 100% perinatal mortality. And the third characteristic is the uh, total lung volume or the fetal lung volume for the age. It may suggest a lethal pulmonary hypoplasia. Postnatal care, we have to take care of the respiratory status. As I've already mentioned, uh, you patient may be having a facial dysmorphism. We have to observe that. The long-term issues include the neurocognitive delay, inguinal hernia, cardiac issues due to severe hypertension. One year survival is around 80 to 85 percent, and the 10 year survival is around 82 percent. Supportive care with the optimization of the nutrition and growth status, and uh, as we are expecting a nearby uh, splenectomy, vaccination should be always uh, up to date, uh, and the additional vaccines has to be given early. Management of renal complications, uh, hypertension is in around 33 to 75 percent. Patient often present with cardiac failure. Uh, AC inhibitor is the drug of choice. Euolemic hyponatremia may be there. But then we have to manage the complications of leakage like the acidosis, uh, mineral bond disease, and anemia too. There is no clarity in the indications for nephrectomy. In few cases, where is refractory hypertension or uh, other condition, we may have to uh, go ahead for nephrectomy. Then other than the uh, renal involvement, we have the hepatic involvement also. It may proceed to patient having an hypersplenism. Uh, in patient with hypersplenism, we may have to do surveillance endoscopy for varices and the management of the same. Polyngitis may present with fever and raised uh, uh, DGT or ALP. So we should be, uh, in case of uh, ARPKD with the uh, um, fever without focus, we have to suspect a cholangitis. We, uh, we should watch for fat-soluble vitamin deficiency. Shunt surgeries may be needed in case of a complicated hepatic status is there. Uh, the ultimate shunt is obviously the liver transplant. Going to case four, we have a seven-year-old boy. He was when evaluated for short stature, detected to have a CKD stage three. USG showed normal sized kidneys with low cortico medullary differentiation, increased echogenicity with fuses. He had hypomagnesemic records in B2B. He had no hypertension, no proteinuria. Screening of his parents revealed mother had a small kidney with cyst and diabetes that developed in her 20s. What is the most likely diagnosis? 
So this is autosomally dominant disease since the patient is having, a parent is having the disease and the kidneys in the mother is small. So the diagnosis is ADTKD and most likely the gene is HNF1 beta. Very good. So it's an ADTKD is distinct, distinct from there are acquired tubular interstitial kidney disease and the ARTK, AR autosomal recessive tubular interstitial kidney disease is the nephronophysis. So ADTKD, ESRD is around 20 to 25 to 70 years. Uh, there is no or delayed onset of hypertension with minimal proteinuria with microscopic or no hematuria. Hyperuricemia disproportionate to the degree of renal function is one important finding. Usually these patients may present with normal sized kidneys or small kidneys with corticomedullary cyst. The genes attributed include the UMOD, MUC1, REN, and HNF1 beta. So now moving on to the uh, CACUT. So what is CACUT? So while the kidney, you know, the components include the nephron collecting system, vessel, the interstitial tissue, ureters, and bladder. The kidney is for, formed from the inter mesoderm, specifically the intermediate mesoderm in the posterior abdominal wall. While the, uh, during the formation of the uh, mature kidney, we have two uh, primitive kidneys, the pronephros and mesonephros, which become kidneys in the lower species or they may form some rem remnant. The mature kidney is formed by the ureteric bud derived from the mesonephric duct and the metonephric mesenchyme. So you have the metanephric mesenchyme, and this is a ureteric bud, which is derived from the mesonephric duct. They induce each other, and from the metanephric mesenchyme, the glomerulus, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted tubule arises. From the ureteric bud, the collecting duct, pelvis, and ureters arise. So there are multiple genes involved in the uh, many steps in many steps. So if any of these are at fault, the patient may develop a caput or if the coordination between the metanephric mesenchyme or the ureteric bite, uh, ureteric bite is at fault, then also a caput can develop. This is the uh, embryology of the bladder. Bladder is formed from the cloaca, lentois and the mesonephric duct. The incidence of CACUT uh, has, uh, has increased uh, since the uniform uh, uh, antenatal screening of all pregnancies. The renal anomalies is around 0.28% of all pregnancies and uh, two-third of this is hydronephrosis. Broadly, we can classify CACUT as uh, the, those affecting the kidney number, size and morphology, which include the renal agenesis, hypoplasia, renal dysplasia, multicystic dysplastic kidney. That including the kidney position include the horseshoe kidney, ectopic kidney, or the pelvic kidney. Outlaw and abnormalities are present in PUJ obstruction, VUJ, or the vesica ureteric junction of obstruction, duplex collecting system, mega ureters, or in the posterior ureteral valve. Here, you can see the kid this kidney is small. So the, here you have the hyperplasia of this kidney. Multiple cysts are seen here, most likely at least multicystic dysplastic kidney. Here you can see uh, two drainage system. So this is the duplex kidney. Here the tortuous dilated bilateral ureter suggests most likely a VUR. And uh, here only the pelvis is dilated and the ureters are intact. Most likely it's a pelvic ureteric junction or the ureteropelvic junction obstruction. Here the posterior urethra is dilated. Uh, it's most likely a posterior urethral one. So coming to the antenatal hydronephros, as I have already mentioned, it is the most common abnormality detected in the antenatal ultrasonography. Here you can see the pelvis, which divides into the major calluses, then it further divides into the minor calluses. This is a normal kidney, where the uh, kidney, pelvis, minor calluses, the medulla and the cortex is intact. Here you have dilatation of the uh, pelvis with some dilatation of the major calluses, the mild hydronephrosis. Usually, uh, these uh, in the ultrasonography, we couldn't see the uh, pelvis at all. Uh, the, if you can see an anechoic or hypoechoic area in the pelvis, it suggests fluid. 
most likely this is hydronephrosis or this is a mild hydronephrosis. Here it has further dilated and there is thinning of the medulla with the involvement of the major calyces and minor calyces. Here it is dilated, it's encroaching into the medulla. It is moderate hydronephrosis. Here you can see the pelvis is further dilated. You cannot see the medulla and the, there is only thin rim of cortex. So it is the severe form of hydronephrosis. Usually the, uh, this is one classification. Usually we express the uh, hydronephrosis as anthropocytic diameter of the pelvis. It is calculated at the plane of the, at the transverse plane along the axis of the kidneys at the level of the hilum. Uh, here we calculate the anthroposterior diameter and it is, it is used to grade and classify antenatal hydronephrosis. Common etiologies, uh, most, uh, the etiologies has, are established after postnatal evaluation. Most important, uh, the outcome depend upon the etiology. So it is important in, uh, to identify the etiology. Transient adnatal hydronephrosis is seen in around 50 to 70 percent cases. The common causes include the PUJ obstruction, vesicourethric reflex, vesicourethric junction obstruction, and the posterior urethral valve. Into the case five, we have a consultation uh, as there was a unilateral hydronephrosis in the field. How will you evaluate? The uh, main points that we we'll ask in case of uh, unilateral hydronephrosis or bilateral hydronephrosis include. You will ask, what is the grade of the antenatal hydronephrosis? Is there oligamnios or not? Is there dysplasia of the kidney or the contralateral kidney? Is there parenchymal kidney? Or is there extra renal malformation? The diagnosis and grading of antenatal hydronephrosis is based on, as per the ISP in 2013 guidelines, it is based on the anthroposterior diameter that I have already shown in the fetal renal pelvis. The anti and antenatal hydronephrosis is present if the second trimester APD is more than four millimeter or the uh, third trimester APD is more than seven millimeter. If it is more than 10 in the second trimester and it is more than 15 in the third trimester, it is graded severe. Another grading system is SFU grading system. Uh, the mild one is with the thin splitting of the sinus. Here you can see the major calyces are dilated minor calyces are dilated, the last SFU grade 4, there is parenchymal thinning also, which is seen in the ultrasonography too. So, while managing an isolated unilateral hydronephrosis, uh, we have to uh, see the what is the third trimester ultras, uh, uh, grading. If it is more, the APD is more than 15 millimeter or it is severe, we have to do the ultrasonography by 3 to 7 years of age. Three, three to seven days of age. If it is done too early, it may underestimate the hydronephrosis. If the APD is more than seven millimeter, then you have to do the ultrasonography by seven days. Uh, so if it is less than seven millimeter, we can wait till three to six months to follow up the hydronephrosis. Case seven, we had an antenatal consultation where sort as a fetus is having bilateral hydronephrosis, oligamnios, and bladder wall thickening. What do you think the patient is having? You have a bilateral hydronephrosis with oligohydramnios and the bladder wall is thickened. Yes, it is. LB uretic junction, no. It's posterior urethral valve, yes. So while we are suspecting a posterior urethral valve, we should see whether, uh, when did the oligamnios appear? Check for the bladder volume. Is there a dysplasia of the kidney? Uh, in some research setting, the uh, yeah, in some setting uh, where the prenatal interventions are there, the amniotic fluid biochemistry is also checked. So you have the posterior urethral valve. It uh, rises as a membrane from the verum and danum, fuses anteriorly, and causes obstruction. Over the time, due to the obstruction, the bladder becomes thickened. The air is uh, secondary reflex into the ureters and there is dilatation and uh, thinning of the cortex or two. So this is the bladder with thick wall and the dilated urethra, posterior urethra. You can see the keyhole sign here. So algorithm for bilateral hydronephrosis, you have to check if the patient is having an oligamnios, 
before or uh, at the age of 20 weeks and the bladder volume is more than 5.4 centimeter cube. That indicates the patient is having a severe level urinary tract obstruction, renal dysfunction. Patient is at risk of perinatal renal dysfunction and perinatal mortality. At that point, we may have to uh, go for in utero management or conservative management. In these kids, we have to repeat the ultrasonography every, uh, every two to six weeks, especially to look for the or, uh, onset of oligohydramnios. And the management will depend upon the gestational age and the availability of the in utero management. In case of suspected bladder outlet obstruction, we have to do immediate postnatal ultrasonography. If we are uh, not suspecting bladder outlet obstruction in a bilateral hydronephrosis, we can wait for five to seven days too. So the prenatal interventions, the aim is to relieve the obstruction, allow for the normal renal development, and maintain amniotic fluid level to allow normal lung development. The options include the vesicoamniotic shunt, surgical ablations of the valve, and serial amnioinfusion. Uh, these uh, are these have their own risks. Uh, the perinatal survival has found to increase with these perinatal uh, prenatal intervention, but at the 6, 12, and 24 months, the survival was similar to that of the controls. Here you can see the vesicoamniotic shunt inserted. Uh, this is the picture showing vesicoamniotic shunt insertion. Uh, in case of a suspected severe posterior uthal valve, the consideration of termination was only uh, considered in presence of, uh, termination is only considered in presence of extra renal life-threatening abnormality as per the current guidelines. Uh, there is one uh, uh, guideline came by the Arcanet Kyakut per group and they classified the uh, bilateral bladder outlet obstruction caused by PUV or urethral atresia based on the amniotic fluid volume, presence of dysplasia of the kidney, uh, on the uh, presence of favorable or unfavorable biochemistry as seen in the table. So when we are having a suspected bladder outlet obstruction in the postnatal period, we have to go ahead with uh, immediate ultrasonography, as I have already mentioned. Uh, then uh, we have to do, uh, if the patient, the, then it is suggesting blood level obstruction, we should do an MCU, go ahead with the cystoscopy. So generally in case of antenatal hydronephrosis, the postnatal evaluation is aimed to assess the overall health of the kid. What is the renal condition of the kid? Is that there is a renal dysfunction or hypertension or proteinuria? What is the lower urinary tract function, whether it is obstructive or reflexive, and the presence of, you have to check for the presence of UTI, and uh, we have to try to identify the etiology of antenatal hydronephrosis too. The postnatal ultrasonography should be done in those with the resolution of antenatal hydronephrosis at the third trimester too. So we should assess the severity of antenatal hydronephrosis, whether there was oligamnios, whether it was unilateral or bilateral, Clinical examination should include uh, examination for extra renal anomalies, especially blood pressure should be taken for uh, the clinical examination. Uh, and then the investigation, urine analysis, uh, renal function, electrolytes investigation to assess the proteinuria. And obviously, the imaging is the most important investigation. So, this is the algorithm. If you have no hydronephrosis, uh, in the initial ultrasonography, as done in the fifth or seventh day, you have to repeat the ultrasonography at one month. The normal ultrasonography at the fifth or seventh day has found around 40% was found to have anomalies in the follow-up ultrasonography. So if you have a grade one, it's a few grade one to two or the APD is seven to 10, no antibiotic prophylaxis is needed. We have to repeat the ultrasonography one month follow -up. then if the patient is having no progression in the uh, hydronephrosis, ultrasonography done around four to six monthly. The patient is having a severe hydronephrosis like a SFU grade three or grade four uh, with APD more than 15 millimeter, you have to investigate. If the patient is having SFU grade three, antibiotic prophylaxis has to be started, then MCU is usually done. If the patient, the condition indicates 
then we will uh, go ahead with diuretic adrenography. If we haven't found anything significant, three monthly USG is enough for the look for the progression of ultrasonography. The patient is having an SFU grade 4, the APD is more than 50 millimeter. Initiate the antibiotic prophylaxis. First, we will go ahead with the uh, MCU. Uh, if the patient is having a VUR, if the patient is having, as Dr. Jitendra has mentioned, if the patient is having a severe VUR, uh, severe grades of VUR, we may have to consider uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. If the patient is having no VUR, we should go ahead with the diuretic renography. Then check for the obstructive uh, pattern is there and the indication for surgery is there. If the indication for surgery is there, we have to go ahead with the pyeloplasty. If uh, not obstructive, we can do the three monthly follow up. Coming to case eight, we have a patient with unilateral antihydronephros with a third trimester androposia diameter of around 20. 5 millimeter, the repeat ultrasonography after two weeks showed a 34 millimeter APD. There is no oligamnios or no re features of renal dysplasia. Uh, what is the most likely etiology? It is unilateral. Yes, it is P most likely posterior urethral junction, PPU, pelvic urethral, sorry, pelvic urethral junction obstruction. Here you can see the pelvis is only dilated, the urethra is intact and it is spread into the uh, renal parenchyma. The uh, pelvis is dilated, thinning of the renal parenchyma is it. there. The bladder and the ureters are intact. Ureteropelvic jun junction obstruction or the PUJ obstruction, usually uh, it usually present with the severe hydronephrosis. Only 8% uh, have my hydronephrosis and the 23 percent are moderate hydronephrosis. The APD diameter is more than 30 and major calicial dilatation is there and the parenchymal thinning if, and the patient is having no VUR or the patient is having an SFU 3 or 4 with VUR, we have to go ahead with a diuretic renography. The diuretic renography can tell us whether uh, what is the clearance, whether it is obstructive or uh, non-obstructive. And it can also tell what is the differential renal function. If the patient is having a differential renal function less than 40% in the affected kidney, and uh, in the follow up, if the differential renal function is falling by around 10%, we can consider for uh, active management like pyeloplasty. Worsening hydronephrosis on follow up, we have to repeat the diuretic renography if the, we are ma managing it as conservative managed. Presence of refractory pain, palpable renal lump and uh, recurrent febrile UTI, relative indication for a pyeloplasty. So what is this image? The one in the left side. Anybody want to answer? It's a DMSA, though here the right kidney, we can show there are no photopenic areas and the uh, borders are clean. Here in the left kidney, you can see there are multiple photopenic areas and the kidney is slightly small. Here, this is the DTPA. Uh, here, uh, normal uptake and excretion. Here, uh, the, there is normal uptake, but after giving the frusamide too, there is retention of the isotope that suggests an obstructive clearance. Here also, there is uptake and retention, but after giving the prusamide, patient can excrete the uh, technetium. So this retention is due to dilatation of the pelvis only. It is not due to obstruction. This suggests an obstructive clearance. To the last case, we have a two-year-old boy uh, incidentally detected to have abnormal ultrasonography of the left kidney. Left kidney is replaced by multiple not communicating cysts. What is the most probable diagnosis? What is the finding you think that uh, finding that you will check in the contralateral kidney? How will you follow? Any first answer is enough. So it's a multicystic dysplastic kidney. The incidence is one in four. 1,300, 80% diagnosed antenatally, more in males, more in left side. One in three patients are associated with urine tract malformation. Uh, complete involution rate is 33% by two years, 47% by five years, 59% by 10 years. 
compensatory hypertrophy uh, is uh, usually seen in the contralateral kidney. You should uh, look for the compensatory hypertrophy of the contralateral kidney. In case of uh, MCDK, uh, postnatal ultrasonography at three months of age, uh, you can consider early scan if it is uh, detected at before 30 weeks. Renal ultrasonography, further you can do at 12 or 24 months to confirm the growth of the contralateral kidney and check for the involution of the multicystic dysplastic kidney. If the contralateral kidney is growing well and no other abnormalities, you have to proceed with the annual blood pressure, urinal analysis and uh, urine protein analysis. Renal ultrasound can be done once at the uh, post puberty. Indication of nephrectomy include uncontrolled persistent hypertension despite the medical management, enlarging renal mass or ultrasonography uh, findings suggestive of progressive enlargement. This all management is almost similar to the unilateral renal, uh, renal agenesis. Here, the extra renal manifestation anomalies are expected in around 31% and other CACUTs are observed in around 32% of cases. Follow-up uh, usually done yearly. And the frequent follow-up may be needed if the patient is having uh, Kyakut or deranged renal function. So I would conclude my talk. Thank you for your patient listening. Very well added, Professor. And I uh, uh, request one second to the audience. If there is any question, you can put in the chat box. Meanwhile, we'll go through the previously asked question. So one question was there, what is the mechanism of tolerance in case of ADP? Okay. The tolerance is a V2 receptor antagonist. And uh, one of the mechanism which is uh, attributed to the, uh, the increase in kidney size or progression of the uh, kidney uh, ADP is the cyclic AMP dependent mechanism. The tolveptin is found to decrease the cyclic AMP level in the tissue level. That is the mechanism. Uh, that's a main mechanism. I'm sure there are main, main other mechanisms. This is a main mechanism. It will decrease the cyclic AMP at the tissue oh. level. Second question is how to manage single kidney with MCDK? Single kidney with MCDK. Okay, you have only uh, one kidney and that kidney is having multi-system. That is not possible. The yeah, multi probably that is not comfortable to uh, like, sir, uh, If you have a uh, single kidney with cysts, that may be the question. Yeah, right. Maybe hypodysplastic single kidney was the, uh, what the audience tried to ask. That hypodysplasia single kidney. Any uh, guidelines, any suggestions to manage that? I'm uh, not aware of any guideline. It's like a dysplastic mm -hmm. kidney while you are managing. You have to, uh, it's like a protective uh, mechanisms you should be aware of. It's like ensure adequate hydration, avoid nephrotoxins. And uh, whenever there is hypertension or protein arise at some point, they may arise. You have to manage actively. Uh, nephroprotective measures should be. Yes, for mild to moderate type of antibiotic. Mild to moderate. Type of antenatal hydrophysis, is there a time gap uh, for the first ultrasound postnatal to be done after one day or after two days like this? Yes, sir. And uh, if it is done very early, then is there a chance of overestimation or underestimation of the hydrophysis? Sir, initially, uh, the ideal time recommended is usually uh, on the ultrasound is preferred before discharge. So if you uh, do the ultrasound early, too early, it's like first, second, or third day that keeps okay. some oliguric period that will underestimate the ultrasonographic findings, underestimate the antenatal hydronephrosis. The antenatal hydronephrosis as measured by APD will depend upon the position of the child, hydration status of the child, and the what is the bladder, is it is uh, underfilled or overfilled. These things will, uh, these will, things will, uh, yeah, they will determine the APD dimension. So initial ultrasound will underestimate the antenatal hydronephrosis even uh, so before discharge it's the dates like like sixth seventh day or fifth or sixth or seventh day you can do an ultrasonography uh, but if it is normal you have to proceed with an ultrasound at one month because I have already mentioned the uh, these days when the ultrasonography is reported normal uh, repeat 
ultrasonography shown abnormality in around 45% cases of cases. 45% cases. So that is. Okay. Any protocol for incidental finding for single visualized kidney with normal function? Normal GFR done ultrasound for some other results and found to have a solitary kidney. Sir, again, I told you, mentioned in the last slide, uh, the, the guideline is to follow up with a yearly KFT, creatinine, proteinuria, and hypertension. If the patient is having associated caput, it's like the patient is having a high, I mean, the UR or anything, it should be more frequent. It has to be done six monthly. Suppose the patient is having a GFR less than 60, then the frequency, again, you have to do more frequently, maybe three to four monthly. Okay, that's fine. And the key message is that kidney size should be at least a bit higher than the normal size. There should be some compensatory hepatopy. The single kidney, and if it's a normal size, then probably it is an abnormal kidney. Is that true? In case of MCDK, we, we are not getting a compensatory hypertrophy of the other kidney. That means the other kidney is having some trouble. Correct, correct. There's one, one question. Um, there was one question initially that what is OFD? Uh, is there any acronym for Oro, orofacial uh, digital syndrome? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Which is associated uh, with cystic kidney disease. So I think most of the questions have been answered directly. So it's, they've already cost around two hours. So thanks, Thank Dr. Christy, for your nice uh, explanation regarding this uh, spoken of topics in our residency. So this will be obviously help our students to for their exam purpose, preferably for their short question type. And with this, we can, uh, they, Dr. Georgi, if sirs and maps are around, you can tell them. Take over the charges from me. Thank you. Yeah, Any uh, comments thank from you all for your participation. Any All right, so I think we can wind up the session. Uh, thank you, Prof. Baka and Dr. Aditi for joining in. Um, also, thank the uh, base speakers, Dr. Jitendra and Dr. Christy. So, see you all next uh, weekend for the next uh, four sessions. Thank you. Next session B will be on Saturday, next Saturday evening 6 30. Link will be sent to our country. Thanks to all the audience. Thanks all. Good night.